My name is Emily Lau, and I'm a cardiologist at the Corrigan Women's Heart Health Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm delighted to be here today to present on an important topic in women's cardiovascular health, hormones, menopause, and contraception. I am generously supported by the grants from the National Institutes of Health and the American Heart Association. The talk today will be split into two broad topics. First, I'll discuss how to assess cardiovascular risk in postmenopausal women prior to initiating menopausal hormone therapy. The second half of the talk will delve into contraceptive options for women with cardiovascular disease. So let's begin with a case. A 54-year-old woman with polycystic ovary syndrome, diabetes, and hypertension is referred to you by her primary care physician. She's been having intolerable hot flashes that occur several times a week and are increasing in frequency. Her PCP is thinking about starting her on menopausal hormone therapy for her hot flashes, but is nervous about her cardiovascular risks given her risk factors and family history. During your visit, you discover that she underwent menopause at the age of 51, and as her PCP noted, she has a significant family history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. She herself is quite healthy. Her BMI is 26 and her blood pressure is normal. Her lipid panel is as shown, and she's not on statin therapy. When you speak with her, you discover that her hot flashes have become so bothersome, and she is desperate to find a solution. She's tried a number of therapies, including black cohosh, SSRI, but the symptoms have not improved dramatically. She asks you whether she would be a candidate for hormone therapy. Before we delve into the question of menopausal hormone therapy, let's do a quick review of the cardiovascular effects of the two major female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen affects the cardiovascular system through both metabolic and vascular effects. Estrogen affects cholesterol production in the liver and decreases LDL cholesterol. In the vasculature, estrogen is thought to be vasoprotective. It promotes vasodilation through the production of nitric oxide and COX-2, and it also reduces the production of endothelin. Finally, it reduces vascular smooth muscle pro cell proliferation. Collectively, these effects are thought to confer relative protection from cardiovascular disease among premenopausal women. Progesterone's effects on the cardiovascular system are less clear, and they're thought to be largely mediated through metabolic effects. For example, insulin levels and insulin response to carbohydrate intake are increased with progesterone. Menopause is the permanent cessation of menstru menstruation for one year that's caused by the loss of ovarian function. The mean age at menopause in the United States is 52. Vasomotor symptoms, including hot flashes and night sweats, represent the most bothersome symptoms of menopause, and they're the most common reason that women present for care at the time of the menopause transition. Other symptoms of note include vaginal dryness, insomnia, and mood changes. Menopause is also a time of accelerating cardiovascular disease risk. Up until menopause, cardiovascular risk in women lags significantly behind that of men, and this is thought to be in part due to the cardioprotective effects of estrogen. So what is menopausal hormone therapy and what is it used for? Menopausal hormone therapy, also referred to as postmenopausal hormone therapy or hormone replacement therapy, is a treatment targeted at the relief of menopausal symptoms. The four FDA-approved indications for menopausal hormone therapy today include, one, relief of vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes or night sweats, two, prevention of osteoporosis, three, estrogen replacement for women with premature hypoestrogenism, like women with premature ovarian insufficiency or premature surgical menopause, and four, for genitourinary syndrome of menopause or vulvovaginal atrophy. Menopausal hormone therapy usually consists of either estrogen alone for women without a uterus um, or estrogen in combination with progestin for women with an intact uterus. And the progestin is necessary to prevent endometrial hyperplasia related to unopposed estrogen therapy. So there are three major formulations of menopausal hormone therapy that we should all be aware of, oral, transdermal, and vaginal. Oral and transdermal estrogen are considered systemic hormone therapy. They have similar efficacy profiles, but the safety profile is thought to be superior in transdermal formulations. Vaginal estrogen is minimally absorbed and it's primarily used for the local treatment of vulvovaginal atrophy related to menopause. 
there's a lot of confusion about who should start menopausal hormone therapy and when to start therapy. And that's in large part due to its pretty controversial history. The history of modern day menopausal hormone therapy in the United States began during the Great Depression when Premarin, a conjugated estrogen that was found in the urine of pregnant horses, emerged on the market for the treatment of hot flashes and other vasomotor symptoms in postmenopausal women. Prescriptions for Premarin quickly rose over the next few de decades. However, in 1975, several studies demonstrated an increased risk of endometrial cancer with unopposed exogenous estrogen therapy, prompting a significant reduction in hormone therapy use. But by the early 1980s, scientists and doctors recognized that the addition of progestin to estrogen reduced the endometrial cancer risk and combination estrogen progestin therapy was developed. And this prompted a revival of menopausal hormone therapy. In the 1990s, observational data from the Nurses Health Study and others found that estrogen therapy was significantly associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. As you can imagine, these findings fueled a dramatic increase in menopausal hormone therapy prescriptions. By the late 1990s, there were 90 million prescriptions for hormone therapy per year in the United States alone. It really seemed like every woman was on hormone therapy at that time. But cracks in the armor began showing in the late 1990s with the publication of the HERS trial. This was a secondary prevention trial that randomized women with established coronary artery disease to receiving combination estrogen progestin therapy versus placebo. While women who were randomized to hormone therapy had a better cholesterol profile, there was an increase in coronary artery disease events in, at one year and no effect after four years. After HERS, we saw a slight reduction in hormone therapy prescriptions. But the nail in the coffin really occurred in 2002 with the publication of the Women's Health Initiative. This was a primary prevention randomized trial of combination estrogen progestin in postmenopausal women without heart disease. And it was terminated early because of an increased risk of breast cancer. The investigators also found an increased risk of coronary disease, stroke, and pulmonary emboli. Following the WHI landmark results, hormone therapy prescriptions plummeted. But since the primary WHI results, subsequent analyses have suggested that the story may be more nuanced. After reviewing the initial trial results again, a new hypothesis called the timing hypo hypothesis emerged. And this hypothesis posits that cardiovascular effects of menopausal hormone therapy may depend on the timing of menopausal hormone therapy initiation in relation to menopause, as well as the age of a woman. The ELITE trial that was published in 2016 found that subclinical atherosclerosis, as measured by carotid media intima thickness, decreased with hormone therapy in women early postmenopause. A similar trial, KEEPS, that was done in 2014, um, did not, however, find a difference in subclinical atherosclerosis, but this was thought to be due to a lower estradiol dose. So after that roller coaster, how do we approach menopausal hormone therapy initiation today? Well, as we mentioned earlier, hormone therapy is now indicated for the treatment of menopausal symptoms and not for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, we first assess a woman's vasomotor symptoms. We confirm that she has hot flashes and her night sweats that are adversely affecting her sleep, daytime functioning, or quality of life. Next, we then assess a woman's risk factors. We want to confirm that there are no absolute contraindications to menopausal hormone therapy, such as breast or endometrial cancer, cardiovascular disease, active liver disease and undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. And finally, once we've established the first two points, we can start thinking about initiating menopausal hormone therapy. For women who are less than 60 years of age and had menopause onset within 10 years and have a low risk of breast cancer and cardiovascular disease, we recommend starting menopausal hormone therapy. Now, if you're older than 60 years of age, menopause onset was over 10 years um, prior, or the woman has a moderate risk of breast cancer or cardiovascular disease, this is a time where we have to have some individual shared decision-making discussions with our patients. And finally, in the last group, if you have a high risk of breast cancer or cardiovascular disease, or age greater than 60, onset of menopause greater than 10 years prior, and a moderate risk of breast cancer or cardiovascular disease, we definitely recommend avoiding hormone therapy initiation. So how do we assess a patient's cardiovascular disease risk when thinking about initiating hormone therapy? 
Well, we really use the same 10-year ASCVD risk calculator that we use for risk stratification for statin therapy. So using that framework, low-risk women include those who have had recent menopause um, and a 10-year ASCVD risk of less than 5%. Intermediate-risk women um, have a 10-year ASCVD risk profile that's greater than or between 5 to 10% and may have a number of comorbidities like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, et cetera. And high-risk women um, include those who have had cardiovascular disease or prior thromboembolic disease, stroke, breast cancer, or have a 10-year ASCVD risk greater than 10%. So let's put that all together. When I see a patient in my clinic who is thinking about starting menopausal hormone therapy, I really look at two elements. The first is how many years has it been since she's gone through menopause? And the second is what is her 10 year ASCVD risk? For women who are less than 10 years post-menopause and have low ASCVD risk, menopausal hormone therapy is A-OK. -okay. For women who are less than 10 years post-menopause with an intermediate ASCVD risk, we generally say that menopausal hormone therapy is okay, but we prefer a transdermal formulation. Now for women who are greater than 10 years post-menopause and either low or intermediate ASCVD risk, we do recommend considering alternative therapies and avoiding systemic hormone therapy if possible. But if a woman has very severe vasomotor symptoms, this is the time when one can have an individualized shared decision-making discussion with their patient. Now, for women who are at high risk um, for a cardiovascular event, we really recommend avoiding systemic hormone therapy, no matter the number of years since menopause onset. So let's get back to our case. Our patient is experiencing intolerable vasomotor symptoms, so she has an indication for menopausal hormone therapy. Now, how about her risk? Well, she's young. She's less than 60 years old. The onset of menopause was less than 10 years ago. She's thin, her blood pressure is normal, and her lipid panel looks pretty good. These qualities make her low risk. However, she does have a history of PCOS, diabetes, and hypertension, and she also has a pretty significant family history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. These risk factors would put her in the intermediate category. So all in all, I would say that she would probably be okay for menopausal hormone therapy, but would certainly recommend a transdermal formulation if possible. So to summarize, Menopausal hormone therapy is approved for vasomotor symptoms, prevention of bone loss, premature hypoestrogenism, and vaginal atrophy. While early observational studies of hormone therapy suggested a beneficial effect on cardiovascular risk, large randomized trials have revealed an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But new data and looking at the original data suggests a more nuanced picture. Time since menopause onset, the age of a patient, and the type of formulation of hormone therapy should all be considered prior to initiating menopausal hormone therapy. Finally, individualized assessment of risk and benefit and shared decision-making is crucial prior to initiating menopausal hormone therapy. So let's now change gears to discuss contraception for women with existing cardiovascular disease. So here's another case, a 34-year-old woman, G1P1 from Ethiopia, with rheumatic bowel disease. She's not functionally limited and she reports no symptoms. On physical exam, she has a loud S1, normal S2, opening snap and diastolic murmur. Her EKG shows a normal sinus rhythm with a few PACs and her echo demonstrates a mitral valve area of 1.2 centimeters squared and a mean gradient of seven with some trace MR. After you go through her exam and echo findings, you realize that you have not discussed what she's doing in terms of reproductive planning. It's incredibly important for cardiovascular clinicians to assess the need for contraception and appropriateness of contraceptive method, both at the time of initial assessment and all subsequent encounters in all reproductive age women with cardiovascular disease. And this is an area where we have a long way to go. Only about 24% of US women meet recommended metrics on reproductive counseling. So before we go further, let's make sure we all have the same contraception vocabulary. There are three tiers of contraceptive methods based on level of efficacy. Tier one is, are the most effective contraceptive methods, whereas tier three are the least effective. Tier one methods include permanent sterilization, long acting reversible contraceptives like an IUD and implants. And the failure rate for tier one methods is really low, less than 1%. Tier two methods 
include combined hormonal contraceptives, progestin only pills, and depot medroxy progesterone acetate um, injections. And the failure rate there is about six to 12%. Finally, tier three methods have the least um, efficacy and their failure rates are about 18 to 28%. And they include barrier methods, withdrawal and natural family planning. Now to put contraception in context, if a woman has no contraceptive on board, she has an 85% risk of becoming pregnant within one year. The US medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use put out a set of very detailed guidelines for assessing the safety of contraception by cardiovascular condition. Here I'm presenting an adapted and highly simplified version of their guidelines. Green means no restriction, yellow means advantages outweigh risks, orange risk outweigh benefits, and red means unacceptable health risk. As you can see, both copper and levonorgestrel IUDs, as well as progestin only pills are thought to be pretty safe in all cardiovascular conditions. Implants are also overall quite safe, except for the specific case of stroke. Depo Provera has thought to be unfavorable in hypertension, women with a number of ASCVD risk factors, ischemic heart disease, and stroke. And of course, combined hormonal contraceptives really carry the greatest risk in almost all conditions. And this is largely due to an increased risk of thromboembolism that's associated with the estrogen-containing method. Current preparations have lower risk of thromboembolism than previous high-dose estrogen preparations, um, and importantly, it still has lower thromboembolic risk than pregnancy itself. But nevertheless, combined hormonal contraceptives are really not recommended for individuals at high risk for thromboembolism. So taking that all together, long-acting reversible contraceptives like the IUDs are really the recommended choice of contraception for women with cardiovascular disease, particularly those who are at increased risk of cardiovascular complications of pregnancy. And this is really due to superior safety and efficacy profiles. Let's do a slightly deeper dive into the hormonal contraceptive options. Hormonal IUD and to a lesser extent, subdermal implants are the recommended options for women with cardiovascular disease as they are safe and effective, as we just mentioned. Hormonal IUD results in lighter menses, so they are particularly good options for patients who are on anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy. Subdermal implants cause more bleeding, so they're not necessarily ideal for women on antithrombotic therapy. Now, moving on to progestin-only pills, these are good options, particularly for women who are at increased venothromboembolism risk, as there's no increase in thromboembolism, but it does require very strict adherence because you have to take these pills every day at the same time. Depo-Provera shots have an uncertain thromboembolic risk, but they do give uh, lighter menses, and so they can be used in women on antithrombotic therapy. And finally, all estrogen-containing contraceptives, including pill, patch, or ring, increase thromboembolism. And just to remind ourselves of the conditions that are associated with elevated thromboembolic risk with combined uh, hormone contraceptive use. These include um, adult congenital heart disease like Fontan, cyanosis, specific valvular heart disease um, conditions, anyone with a mechanical bileaflet valve, for example, vascular disease, cardiomyopathy, including postpartum cardiomyopathy, a history of venothromboembolic disease, and atrial arrhythmias. So let's go back to our case. This is a 34-year-old woman, reproductive age, with rheumatic mitral valve disease with moderate mitral stenosis. She's asymptomatic and does not yet have evidence of complicated valve disease, but she's certainly at risk for developing them. Based on the US medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use, she has no restriction for all contraceptive methods except for combined hormonal contraception. Since she's at risk for developing atrial fibrillation, we would definitely recommend against combined hormonal contraception. And of the remaining options, we think that levonorgestrel IUD is probably the best option as it's safe, it's effective, and it also results in lighter menses, which is important if she were to develop atrial fibrillation and need anticoagulation. So in summary, for women with cardiovascular disease, preconception counseling and pregnancy planning are absolutely necessary to optimize the health of both mom and baby. Choosing a method of contraception requires consideration of safety, efficacy, patient preference, and risk of unplanned pregnancy. And finally, intrauterine devices and subdermal implants are generally recommended for women with cardiovascular disease. On that final note, thank you so much for spending this last half hour with me, and I look forward to our discussion.